Today, we, uh, so a few days ago, we made a presentation on one of the groups that support as part of research uh, in Nigeria, a youth organization. And uh, we also have um, in our midst uh, one of the leading documentary filmmakers and photographers and activists on the Amazon, uh, George Badansky, who is sitting right there at the back, and perhaps one of the most important filmmakers from Brazil. And uh, he uh, presented his own work first at the COP, and it's presented here on Minamata, which is a cautionary tale uh, based on illegal mining in Brazilian Amazon uh, using mercury and the impact of that. And he references the disaster that happened in Japan a while ago, 50 years ago. But uh, George is actually a compendium of different film traditions and heavily studied and written about by some of our coll colleagues as well. Uh, but today we have this rare opportunity um, as a continuation of what's been going on. I'm, I must also add that we just had an amazing uh, workshops on uh, the climate and the law, right? Uh, which is really a very animated uh, conversation as well. But today we have the rare exception of uh, welcoming um, His Excellency Professor Yemi Osimbanjo, who um, was the immediate uh, past vice president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Um, but more than that, he's also one of us as a scholar, as a leading, one of Nigeria's leading legal scholars who has played a transformative role as um, head of department of public law, dean of the school of law, attorney general of Lagos State, and whose models are, were so exemplary that other state governments in Nigeria began to mimic the strategies of that state, but subsequently he became uh, 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 vice president of Nigeria. Um, so he was attorney general and commissioner for justice in Lagos State from 99 to 2007, and some of the far-reaching significant judicial reforms will become the models for other states of the federation. But before his uh, political career, um, Professor Sibanjo excelled as a lawyer and earned what in Nigeria is the prestigious and the most senior form of advocacy for the law, the senior advocate of Nigeria. He was also a founding um, partner of Simmons Coopers, a prominent commercial law firm in Nigeria, and contributed to the academic community as a professor, head of department and dean at the University of Lagos. Throughout his time in public service, Professor Sid Manger played a key role in implementing various government initiatives and policies, most notably in the areas of economic reform, social intervention programs, and addressing issues related to justice and energy security in African nations. He chaired the Interministerial Energy Transition Implementation Committee, uh, which was responsible for the development and execution of the Nigerian Energy Translation Plan. Furthermore, he's led um, successful implementation of Nigeria's Economic Sustainability Plan, which included the deployment of five million off-grid solar connections to rural communities in Nigeria. Beyond his tenure in office, uh, he remains dedicated to advocating for climate action, both within Nigeria across the African continent, um, as well as globally. In two, 2023, recently, he was appointed as the first global advisor to the Global Energy Alliance for, the pe for Peoples and Planet. He's also the board chair of the Climate Action Platform for Africa. Um, I, apart from, we've had numerous conversations, but it's actually the, 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 both his theoretical acumen and practical experience in governance and in creating instruments of realizing strategies on energy transitions that we really felt um, was, were very attractive. And I think he had a brief conversation with this uh, conference earlier today. And today he will give you his own presentation so you hear from him. After that, we'll have a short conversation together with two of our colleagues 
who were also developing the same tra trajectory of conversations. We'll, we'll, I'll introduce them later after Professor Sibanjo's uh, presentation. Thank you very much, everyone, and uh, good evening. Um, I'd first like to thank uh, the NYU Abu Dhabi campus for uh, the very kind invitation to speak to you today. And uh, I must say that the NYU has proved itself to be an important uh, thought leader and generational convener on the conversations on climate change and climate action, especially as uh, the NYU here is a key academic partner to uh, the COP presidency. And I'm told also the inaugural chair of the, uh, the university's climate network, which I'm also told brings together about 20 uh, universities in the UAE, and that number is still growing, and is aimed at encouraging youth engagement. And I think youth engagement in these conversations on climate change is the eminently sensible way of acknowledging that the subject is of greater relevance to the generation that will live through the consequences of action or inaction. I'll be speaking for a few minutes on the topic climate positive growth, Africa as a climate action partner for the UAE and for the world. We are, as I'm sure everyone will agree, at a crucial moment in the energy transition journey. And it's evident that at the rate that we're going in that journey, to net zero, we have absolutely no chance of meeting the target. Yet we miss the target at the peril of our world as we know it, if science is to be believed. Not far from here, yeah, in Dubai, as we speak, many of the world's political, private sector, and civil society leaders are assembled to discuss and negotiate these same questions at the annual UN Climate Conference, COP28. 28, and I want you to let that number sink, the 28th UN Annual Climate Conference. For many years, the science has been crystal clear. If we do not curb emissions and get to net zero by uh, 2050, and some say even earlier, we risk the apocalyptic consequences for life on Earth. 2023 has already driven home this point by the very many uh, record-breaking uh, weather devastations. So why has it taken 28 annual rounds of painful negotiations just to be where we are now, which is, of course, very far from where we need to be? I would argue that one of the key reasons is that climate action has long been seen as too costly. It is generally believed that climate action and economic growth are incompatible. And to realize effective climate action, you have to sacrifice growth. And of course, that is a price that developed countries are generally not willing to pay, and emerging and developing economies are simply unable to pay. Why? Because one in every four human beings born by 2040 will be an African. And Africa today is the fastest warming region, which means that it's the most exposed to the devastations of climate change or the potential devastations. Africa is also aspiring to middle to high income status for its peoples. But if Africa were to develop by the same carbon intensive pathway employed by wealthier countries, then the world will never achieve net zero. Why? Because Africa will annually pump 9.4 gigatons of CO2e into the atmosphere. And Africa would go from being a mere rounding error in global emissions to representing as much as 75% of global emissions. So in many senses, Africa can be the nemesis of the world or an important partner in solving the problem. Now, how will that work? Africa can develop without increasing carbon emissions and not even keeping it constant, but actually reducing emissions. So I'll argue that economic growth and effective climate action can actually work together. And that is possible by this notion of climate positive growth, 
climate positive growth. Now, this is the ability to realize economic growth through climate action. And Africa has the potential to be a climate positive growth leader, helping the world arrest and reverse climate change while developing to middle to high income status and beyond. And my position is that this is a clear possibility with global collaboration. So what is the case for climate positive growth? The first is somewhat ironic, and that is Africa's low industrial base and its low carbon footprint. And this can actually be an advantage, enabling the continent to develop greenfield clean energy manufacturing, saving it the cost of abandoned legacy carbon intensive manufacturing projects, and by pursuing an industrialization pathway that focuses on using renewable energy, of which Africa has the most potential. Africa is home to 60% of the world's best solar resources. And in addition, it has abundant wind, geothermal, and hydro potential. Its untapped renewable energy potential is 50 times the anticipated global demand for electricity in 2040. And also Africa, of course, has the fastest, youngest uh, growing workforce on the planet. And with it, um, of course, with the massive natural resources, including arable land and critical mineral assets, of which it has about 30%, it can actually become or develop the first green industrial civilization, greening global manufacturing and supply chains, and even removing carbon from the air. In other words, Africa is perhaps the only region today, ironically, on account of its low development base, that can truly achieve green growth, economic growth without growing emissions, or even keeping emissions constant, but actively addressing the reduction of emissions and the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. But what does this mean in practical terms? It means, for example, that if Africa processed the bauxite that it mines, which is 25% of global bauxite production, to aluminum, with renewable energy before exporting it, would actually save 335 million tons of CO2e per year. That's 1% of global emissions. Create 280,000 jobs annually and generate about 37 billion US dollars of additional revenue for the continent. In fact, by aggressively deploying its renewable energy resources, Africa can actually provide energy to all Africans, 600 million of whom currently do not have access to energy, and 150 million of whom have unreliable access, unreliable access to energy at 30% lower cost, and with over 90% lower emissions per kilowatt hour compared to the current stated policies. So Africa's renewable energy is not only abundant, but also has very low seasonality or intermittency, which makes it possible to reliably provide renewable base load to power continuous industrial production. Strikingly also, the lowest cost setup of solar, wind, and battery storage to get reliable renewable base load to power industry is twice as expensive in Germany as it is in Nigeria. So solar PVs in Nigeria and in Kenya, for instance, vastly outperformed Europe's industry center and even Europe's top PV sports. The same battery supported PV system in Nigeria will enable a base load that is eight times as large as in Germany, and in Spain, 1.8 times larger. A recent Bloomberg study done for the AFDB on the manufacturing of battery precursors found that manufacturing battery precursors in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, DRC, which of course, as you know, has plenty of lithium and cobalt, is three times cheaper than manufacturing the same in the US, in the EU, or even in China. And manufacturing in the DRC would also extend value chain opportunities to other African countries. And they would need, of course, they would need manganese from Zambia, from Tanzania, from Gabon, and from South Africa to contribute to, the, to, uh, to their capacity to produce these battery precursors. And interestingly, several African countries now have restrictions on raw exports of critical minerals, 
indeed over 42% of African countries, excluding North African countries, have these restrictions. So mining companies are now establishing local processing plants, and this is great. But to reap maximum rewards for climate action and development, uh, then processing and mining must be done by the use of renewable energy. So the mining and processing must be done by renewable energy. Otherwise, it, it, the, the, the real advantages can never be obtained. And this makes perfect economic sense. The most recent uh, IEA publication made clear that renewable energy is now not just the climate smart, but also the economically rational choice. So for the first time in history, going renewable first, even with storage, is the cheapest overall form of energy generation. And these costs are expected to fall further in the next few years. So as we allocate our global financial resources, we should make sure to get the greatest bang for buck, as they say, which means investing in places where those resources will have the highest and most consistent yield, where they can immediately be deployed towards new economic activity, as where there is less existing infrastructure that needs to be decarbonized. A substantial part of foreign funding that is today flowing into Africa's renewable energy projects is concessional and grant funding. And this is, of course, has to be the case because investing in generating capacity without secured demand is like trying to clap with one hand. It really wouldn't work. It may generate much needed energy access, but it will struggle to last and will struggle even more to scale. So green industrialization is the path to making sure that grid scale investments in renewable energy in Africa generate the kind of return profile that will attract private capital and sovereign wealth funds you know, uh, into the mix. That is why the twin approach that uses industrialization to drive energy access is critical. It's a way to get the anchor demand that will draw in the investments. So what will it take to realize climate positive growth? What will it take to, getting, uh, to get these developments that we're talking about uh, and to truly create a green, industrial, uh, a green industrial region of the world? Four things are necessary. Two, that African countries can and should work on, and two, that require global partnerships and engagement. African countries, one, need to, one, focus their economic growth and development plans on these green opportunities. In other words, they must devote the economic plans and development plans to these green opportunities. And it's interesting that several African countries are beginning to do so, you know. And after, especially after uh, some of the developments culminating in the climate summit in Nairobi last September, where the Africa Union endorsed the paradigm of climate positive growth. A lot of work is being done by African countries to think in terms of using uh, that development paradigm in uh, budgets and in, in, in thinking through some of the issues uh, around development. Two, they need to structure policy and regulations in ways that will support uh, the, uh, the, this green industrialization. We then need two pieces of global collaboration. The first is fair and equitable market access to meet the global demand for green products, services, and carbon credits. So for example, as the EU builds out its carbon border adjustment mechanism and other regions look at similar measures, these need to be designed in such a way that does not exclude the locations most suitable to rapidly and affordably decarbonizing global production. So the sea bombs must not exclude, uh, must, must, must be operated in such a way that they don't block market access to places where, uh, uh, to places that are most advantageous for, uh, for uh, green production. This includes not only demand for industrial products, but also for carbon credits. Emerging economies, and in particular African economies, have suffered disproportionately low market share 
and they attract some of the lowest prices. So a lot of the carbon credits coming out of Africa, of course, attract very, very low prices. Admittedly, carbon markets are far from perfect. And these days, not a week goes by without an expose of one kind or the other about bad carbon credits, and often African. And whilst these issues exist in the market, it's important not to lose sight of one of the core drivers of this problem. And that is the current price of carbon credits coming out of Africa. About 50 cents to a few dollars per ton in the voluntary carbon market. And now it's simply impossible to generate quality credits at that kind of price. Because that price needs to cover the costs of developing a project, of generating and trading the credit, of conducting proper monitoring and evaluation, of paying taxes, and generating viable returns for all stakeholders involved, from local communities to project developers to the providers of risk capital. So when you find later that these projects do not consistently meet high quality and integrity standards, uh, one of course cannot be very surprised. It's like uh, buying a Rolex watch for $20 and being upset when it turns out to be counterfeit. I mean, really, you, you, you had no clue. So, so, so the second condition to make uh, climate positive growth a reality for which we need global co collaboration is the right type and amount of investments and capital. Interestingly, the UAE, for instance, has shown a great deal of farsightedness in its investment commitments to the development of renewable energy in Africa. At the Africa Climate Summit, uh, the UAE gave a non-binding letter of intent for $4.5 million, $4.5 billion of um, investments towards clean energy and $450 million for carbon credits. MASTA, the UAE's clean energy champion, has also announced a partnership with Afri Africa 50, the Pan-African uh, Infrastructure Investment Platform to identify, fast track, and scale clean energy projects across the continent. In March also, Mazda consummated perhaps the biggest green energy deal in Africa by acquiring South African uh, renewable energy company, Lekela, in a joint venture with Egypt's Infinity Power. So clearly, you know, there's quite a bit of engagement, especially from the UAE. Now, on the question of accessing the right quantum of capital, it's evident, of course, from, every, from all of what we've seen, that the cost of capital in Africa is inexorably high. African governments pay five times as much interest in the bond market as they would if multilateral development banks were properly capitalized. As a matter of fact, cost of borrowing for, for African countries is probably the highest of any region. Those seeking investments for private projects face high costs of capital and on helpfully short tenors, driven largely by both real and perceived risk factors. So addressing this requires a range of interventions. I'm addressing this high cost of capital. It really requires a whole range of interventions. And I'll just very quickly um, structure them into three important categories, all of which need to be delivered upon. The first category is keeping past promises including operationalizing the loss and damage fund, which was agreed last year at COP27. At at, at COP and then, of course, the commitments to the 100 billion a year in climate finance for developing countries. So just keeping those promises is an important uh, way of controlling the high, you know, the, the high cost of capital for African countries. The second is a reform of the international financial architecture. And these have been identified uh, in the Bridgetown Initiative and the Capital Adequacy Framework, amongst others. So it's very evident that there is a need for a restructuring, a, a restructuring of the global financial architecture. And this has been accepted by even the IMF, the World Bank, you know, the UN. Everyone sort of accepts that the, the um, uh, uh, Bretton Woods institutions and several of the other frameworks developed after the World War was of course developed by industrialized countries, for industrialized countries, and are no longer necessarily fit for purpose today. Now this includes a wide range of tools that increase and strengthen the balance sheet of multilateral development banks. 
and ensure more of their deployment goes to emerging and frontier economies and drive more deployment towards climate aligned investments. So there are some technical solutions that have been suggested, such as rechanneling of SGRs uh, of uh, special drawing rights, smart capital blending and tailored risk mitigation interventions. All of this uh, uh, are supposed to be very, will, will, will be the components of this reform, but I don't want to us to get into too much detail. There are so many components of that reform. The fourth is dealing with the huge burden of sovereign debt. The huge burden of sovereign debt. And that's a very major problem. Uh, uh, there was a, an article uh, jointly authored very recently uh, by um, three African uh, three African leaders. The title of the of the article is "If you want our countries to address climate change, first pause our debts." And the three authors were the president of Kenya, President William Ruto, the president of the AFDB, Dr. Akira Deshino, and Musa Faki, the president of the AU Commission. And in that article, they reiterated a call for a 10-year moratorium on interest payments on African debt to give the world's most vulnerable countries the space to invest in climate resilience and other pressing needs, such as health and education. They also argued for more climate-targeted debt relief. For example, debt for nature swaps, debt for climate, you know, where, you know, as you know, a portion of a nation's foreign debt is forgiven in exchange for local investments in environmental conservation measures. And the fifth is identifying new additional sources of finance, investment, and capital through new levies, carbon pricing, and taxation. Many tools and levers are being considered, and the support for, against uh, them, often follows a predictable pattern linked, linked usually to short-term economic interests. I'll just spend the next uh, couple of minutes on uh, the role of gas in the energy transition. Now, the role of gas in the energy, in energy transition has become divisive, especially since while actively banning new investments in fossil fuel projects in Africa, most global North countries, including Japan, China, and large parts of Asia, and the EU, include gas as a major pillar of their multi-decade decarbonization plans. You know, but despite that, they, you know, there's a, uh, a, a ban by several uh, of these countries and institutions associated with them on public investments in, in African fossil fuel projects, especially gas. Nevertheless, it is evident that for gas-rich countries in particular, gas as a transition fuel makes perfect sense. But it's also evident that this can only be transitionary. Renewable energy is now becoming a cheaper source of energy anyway, as we've seen earlier. Now let's look at you know, some of the economics, economically smart deployment of gas, you know, because deploying gas today will depend, you know, on some of the distinctions that we can make broadly between the different types of use cases. The first type of use case is countries that are investing in new exploitation of unexploited resources or those who are growing the production of existing resources. Such countries, I think, must look out first for stranded assets, because these assets, of course, will become very difficult to insure and to refinance. And as the world moves towards, you know, uh, in the energy transition journey, towards uh, decommissioning fossil fuel projects and gas projects, it's just going to become increasingly more difficult to, to, to insure projects like that, or to finance or refinance such projects. So that's just the reality. And countries that are growing new, uh, exploiting new sites must simply watch out for that. Countries should also avoid creating or growing their dependency on gas. Unlike many other parts of the world, African countries do not need to use gas themselves, given their abundance of renewable energy potential, not even for industrialization, as we've seen. Conversely, creating a domestic dependency makes countries vulnerable to price volatility. 
using your own gas may, of course, create a sense of energy independence, but you may still incur opportunity costs from domestic consumption. So many experts, for example, praise uh, Norway's development model. Norway, of course, as you know, has exploited its fossil fuel wealth, creating, uh, serving global demand, and has used the proceeds to aggressively build renewable energy. As, it, as they say, never getting high on uh, its own supply. The, the, the second use case looks at low income countries with existing gas infrastructure that have already incurred the sunk cost of building the fixed infrastructure. Now, ideally, these countries should deploy their domestic infrastructure towards future proof solutions, climate smart solutions. But then, Today, gas-powered cooking results in much lower emissions and cleaner indoor air than using wood or charcoal, you know, and of course gas can also be used for direct air capture, which removes atmospheric carbon dioxide. And gas can also be used for domestic fertilizer production, which is the case in many of these countries, to reduce import dependency and coal phase out in, in heavy industry. So a lot of cement industries, for example, in, uh, in Nigeria, of course, use a lot more gas now than coal and are moving, you know, and many are moving to, you know, at, attempting, of course, to reduce uh, carbon emissions in this way. So these domestic gas uses, uh, use cases should be transitionary and should help accelerate a path towards long-term renewable first or renewable only deployment. And I think that this is really the way to go. I mean, gas is transition fuel and should be seen as transition fuel. I don't think we should argue too much about that, but then it should be transitionary and we should see it as transitionary. As transitionary. So let me end by saying that we will not meet global net zero targets. If the global north in particular does not take the options that appear to be in the best interests of the global south today, because usually even those advantages are only short term. Ultimately, preserving our civilization is in the best interest of all of us. And I think we need more climate statesmanship to have any chance of achieving our targets. The stewardship to our planet and the generations that will live in it calls for much more self-sacrifice from all of us than we're currently seeing. Thank you very much.